case n, the variable that it's you know being contended by all these threads and processes is called critical resource. And the, the piece of code that touches it is called critical section. Okay, so Mr. Steph, I have a feeling that you've said that as a joke. All of you never call sleep to fix a synchronization problem. If you do that, I will be really harsh with my grading and future colleagues of yours will hate your guts. If you do that, you are just delaying a bug and then maybe the children of your children of your children using your program which was so awesome will just you know civilization will end because and adding a sleep to solve a synchronization problem postpones it for the moment when the probability of it gets really big so no sleep synchronization mechanisms that's what you need okay so to go again at it, what we've seen here was a race condition. N is the critical resource, and this piece of code is the critical section. So now, <clears throat> uh, let's go to uh, synchronization mechanisms. Now, there are a number of them. It's mutex, it's read write lock, it's barrier, it's conditional variable, it's, uh, oh, there is another one I'm having, and uh, there is a semaphore. So there are five of them. We're going to start with the mutex, and then we're going to go one by one through each of them. So let's see the mutex. How does a mutex solve this issue? No, not you. Oh, wait. I wrote this functions at the suggestion of your colleagues, and now it looked really weird. Okay, this is it. So this is the va the variant that solves the race condition. But let me clarify what mutex are mutexes are and how they are used and so on. Uh, first, mutex comes from mutual exclusion, is a mechanism that allows us to restrict access to a piece of code to a single thread. That's it. So what we're trying to do is to make sure that N++ will be executed by a single thread at a time. Anything else, this can happen simultaneously in many threads, but this must happen one by one, sequentially. So then we will put here something that will say lock, and only one of the threads can catch that lock. The others will wait while the one thread that won has the lock. And when the thread that has the lock is done, we'll do here an unlock. And after that unlock, there will be another battle for the lock by all the threads, and one of them will win, maybe the same one. And then again, it will enter the critical section, do an N++, and then unlock, and so on. This is exactly what we're doing here. So a mutex is a variable of type pthread mutex t. You'll see that the names are rather long here. We add right here an initialization of the mutex. This null keeps place of, uh, of attributes that control the, function of the functioning of the mutex. For now, we leave the defaults, but I will mention that there was a robot deployed on Mars which was restarting every five minutes. It was rebooting, and its solution was in these attributes. So if I get the time next, I mean, not next, the week after the vacation, I'll tell you the story. So we declare the mutex. We need to declare it globally because it ha will it will be used in the thread as well. We initialize it here. We destroy it here. And then we just call lock and unlock here. And that's it. 
So the programs are identical, save for these five extra lines. Now let me see what is Water Addict saying. Can, okay, can't we create N statically in F? Uh, yes, thank you, Berzent. I will, I will touch on that solution. Uh, ov obviously, if you do this here and then you return the value here, then you'll be fine, yes. If is the main process considered a thread, in other words, that's yes. Every single process has a main thread. And then we create other ones. And that main thread, when it ends, the process ends. And then everything that is still not finished in the process ends as well. All right. So are there questions about this mutex thing? Please come up with questions. I'll compile it and run it. So now this returns 10 million. Basically, what what Berzant is saying and Mortuary is saying, it, it's it's similar with what happens today with uh, possibly with uh, functional programming. So you run this asynchronously and then you get back a result, and that's just fine. Uh, nowadays, people are trying to program with less and less locks because they are complex. But behind the scenes, the, the libraries that that don't use locks will have some locks. So the locks are not really gone. So I'm showing you this whole thing because at a point or another you will bump into it. Not all code is functional and not all problems are fit for to be solved by, by functional solutions. So you need to know how to deal with this kind of stuff every now and then. <clears throat> so if we run this, you can see that it gives the correct result, 10 million. But you may also notice that it's slower. Let's let's see. Command time will time the execution. So no sync, although it gives a bad result, takes about 55 milliseconds. Whereas the correct one takes 755 milliseconds. So it's about 12 times, 12, 14 times slower. So synchronization is uh, practically brings in correctness but kills performance. So you'll always need to think about this, how to do it so that you don't impact performance too much. Let me see what comes next here. Okay. So I'm going to go now into another race program. It's going to be different, maybe a little more complex. But I need it so that I can introduce a new synchronization mechanism, which is called the read-write lock. For mutex, there is not much else to say. Really, you just lock and unlock. And you make sure you, you protect in between those lock and locks all the, the critical resources. But you can have more than one critical resource. You can have more than one critical section. Sometimes you need a bunch of mutexes. So it's not that you need just one. You need to understand how things execute simultaneously. And you need to decide how best to protect critical sections to get correct results. All right, now let's move to this other race condition. This is going to be a little longer to read. So the story goes like this. We have two global variables and we have some threads that increment them both and some threads that compare them. And when they are not the same value, we consider that to be an error. So that's all that program does. Let's see here. In the main function, I have uh, I I have this clock stuff because I want uh, the threads to run for five seconds. So I'm just initializing here. This is the preferred way to get the time in in Linux. Uh, let's see. 
How soon should we unlock the variable? If I want to do multiple things with the variable, do I just lock it to do my things and then release it or lock it? Well, Mortuary, this is a good question. You'll see it here and I'll be, I'll be able to answer on this code. You unlock it as soon as possible while it's still correct. Let's, let's use this as a, as a rule for now. Okay, as soon as possible, but it must be <laughs> correct. So looking at this program, I'm just registering the current time here. And then I'm creating two threads that run the writer function and then 18 more who run the reader function. And then I'm just waiting for all of them to finish. So that's all That's all that main does. Record current time, actually the program start time, and then create 20 threads. Now the rest of the functions in here are function go tells me when I'm out of the five seconds that I want to be running. So it just gets the time, the current time, calculates difference from the start time. And if it's less than 5,000 milliseconds, it says, yeah, you can keep going. Using this function, I can write something like this, while go, okay? So when I'm beyond five seconds, this will end. Function idle is just a little bit of a delay. It's a 10 millisecond delay that I'm using in the writer. And it's important because the case that I'm making here is many writes, sorry, many reads, few writes. So the writer does what? Does what? For five seconds, sleeps 10 milliseconds, and then increments these two variables. And it just keeps doing this. So practically, there will be about 500 increments in five seconds, right? The reader for five seconds, increments how many times it actually read the values and how many times they were different. At the end, prints out the result. Okay? So let's just execute this. It will take five seconds. <clears throat> so each thread, each reader, had about 1.3 million reads and found no error. Every time it read, x was equal to y. This is this is not necessarily going to be like this always. It still is. I'm hoping I'm not going to have to insist too much to see an error. Because this code, here you go. So... This is really, race conditions are all a matter of chance. You have enough, you know, uh, enough agglomeration, enough activity, probability of it manifesting goes up. For now, we don't have a lot, right? We have 500 modifications among million, a million something accesses. Not so much. But sometimes, every now and then, you still get an error, because these two are executing, but right in between them there is a read, and it reads the old y and the new x. So we would need to make this such that x and y are consistent. When you change them, they are consistent. But before doing that, I want to show you how dramatically the number of errors grows, if we move this idle in between x plus plus and y plus plus, practically we make the change a little longer. This is the exact same code, it's just that idle now is in between. So if we run this, if you look closely, most all, all of the reads are errors. Here, for instance, though, there was one correct read. The rest were, were wrong. So it, it's really hard to determine what threads will do. It will depend a lot on how long things take inside the threads. And depending on that, some things will be slower, wronger or not. So this is why race conditions are really hard to fix, because 
they will mostly show up when you give your program to the client. The client uses it a lot, has many users on it, and then this thing starts breaking. And then you get a report that you have a problem and you try to do this on your computer and you have no chance of, of replicating that error. You have no chance of seeing the error because you don't have the amount of usage that the client has. So these are this sometimes can get to scary levels. So the best that you've got is pay attention to the way you write code and understand the concurrent phenomenon. So let's see how we fix this. So one simple way would be to just use a mutex and put a mutex around this and the mutex around this. So practically, we are not going to have simultaneous modifications of x as y, and we're not going to have reads that happen in the middle of a modification. It's either or, right? So then we should never have any errors. So I think this is the next implant, the next example that I've got. So here you go. I just added a mutex. I just, as before, I initialize it and then I destroy it. And I'm just locking and unlocking. I'm protecting this like this and this like this. Now I have, now here, mortuary, here is your answer. Um, is this the way to do it, or is this the way to do it? Will, will this help in any way? Is you're asking how to lock, how to unlock. So this this will be the exact same issue because you will not actually treat X and Y as a whole. You're still having them separated. So what you want is whenever you choose to use a mutex, you have to figure out what is your critical section. What are the critical resources? Here are the critical resources are X and Y. Okay. Then where are they used? What's the critical, what are the critical sections? This and this. All right. This already suggests that I need to treat X and Y as a whole. So then this is the critical section. I cannot break this in two. If I can have multiple smaller critical sections, because the logic of the program permits it, then I would go for it. I may even have several mutexes, but in this one case, I don't. So this is the critical section with both of them. Let me see what are. Yes, William, it will also be slower because there will be a lot more locks. I agree, indeed. So let's uh, execute this. So this will be correct, but the number of reads are significantly less. See this? They went down by about 25% because the reads now cannot just happen. They need to wait until the writes are done. So this went down. And this is expected because locking will slow things down. But this is where this new mechanism comes in. And I'm talking about the read-write lock. The idea is, uh, why do we need, hold on, before I go to read-write lock, headshot spy. Why do we need mutex in the if statement? Here? Because if we don't put this mutex, then this may happen while this is happening. And then X will differ from Y. The idea is that we are trying to change X and Y as a whole. And any difference is considered an error. So then to avoid that, yes, 
these locks will only allow axes to x and y when they are equal. And it's not about them being equal. It's about seeing the whole set of changes as one, not seeing half a change. Without mutexes, you can see half of what is being written, just an x increment, not an y as well. While with the locks, you either see the whole thing or not. They wait. So this is to William. They wait. They really stay stuck there. Just like Reed stays stuck when the pipe is empty. Just like Open is stuck when the FIFO is not open for the uh, com complementary um, operation. They just wait. They don't move. So this is where the read write lock comes in. Read write lock is just like a mutex, but it has two types of locking. It has a write type of locking for writing, which is similar to the mutex locking. And it has a read lock, which is meant for readers. OK, Mortuary, I'll get back to it, because I have to go on with the read locks, and I'll, I'll clarify afterwards. So let me show you the read write lock uh, implementation. Read write lock is just like a mutex, except that you put a instead of mutex you put rw lock. I also changed the name of the variable. Uh, you get to initialize it just like that and destroy it just like that. The difference is here. Unlock is just the same, but here I lock for writing and here I lock for reading. You see that wr lock and rd lock. So what I'm doing <coughs> is I'm saying. When I'm writing, because this is modifying, I'm going to apply a write lock. And the write lock is just like the mutex lock. Only one thread goes through it. When I'm reading, I'm going to apply a read lock. And read lock is permissive. It's also known as a shared lock. As many threads as you want can take a read lock, can go through a read lock, as long as there is no write lock already there. So if you want, the rule is either one of these or as many of these as you want. But there is no mixing. So this kind of thing applies when you have few writes and many reads. And you don't want the reads to wait for the writes. I mean, if we have lots of threads just reading, why should they wait for each other? Why should a read wait for another read, as it was with the mutex. They don't change anything. So you can have many reading at the same time. All you want to do is that when somebody changes, then nobody else touches it, neither for reading nor for writing. So you have this dual way of locking. When you write lock, then it's only one thread in. No readers, no writers. Just that one. When you read lock, you can have as many readers as you want, but no writer. So with this, uh, the performance will go up. There will be more reads than before, and things will still be correct. Let's run it. So you can see that the number of reads went up. Not a lot, but I would say significantly compared to what was before. This kind of use case is relevant in situations where you modify rarely, but you consult frequently. One such example would be a system for buying tickets, right? You buy tickets, concert tickets, let's say. So there will be many people checking the available seats, but very few people buying compared to how many are, check are checking. So then you don't want the people who check the available seats to wait for each other just to see what's available. They can look at once. But if anybody's buying, then you want everybody to wait for that guy to finish his, its purchase because that will change the state of available seats. 
Hence, buying will be using a write lock and just viewing the availability will use read locks. Now let's see, <coughs> let's see your questions. So mortuary, in conclusion, we lock and unlock for each whole change. It's, it's hard to give you such a broad statement. It really depends on the problem. In this problem, I define as correct when X and Y are, are, are identical. So then, yes, I have to change. I have to treat the whole change. Me, I defined this as being correct. But sometimes, uh, think of it like this. When you buy... When you buy... Uh, uh, a concert ticket. Not only do you have to mark the seat as taken, you also have to uh, maybe adjust the pricing. You know, sometimes they adjust the price of the seats based on how much it's available. So then for that, for instance, you would want to treat that as a whole, right? You don't want people to see new prices while the old seat is still free. Something like that. Right? You define what is correct for you. Now, I need to scroll up because there are many questions and I missed some of them. How on earth does P-Thread Library know whether we read or write? Oh, it doesn't. So this is for Water Addict. It doesn't. We tell it with this. We know that we're reading and writing and we choose the appropriate lock to use. Yes, but when we read log, how does the log know? It doesn't. It doesn't matter. The log doesn't, doesn't care at all that we are doing equal equal. We are the ones that declare we are going to take a read log. So whoever also takes a read log, let it through. But if there is a write log, don't let it through until all the readers are gone. We are telling it we're taking a write lock. If any other write lock or read lock comes in, don't let them through. So it's us defining this behavior. Uh, so uh, there are a number of colleagues who answered things to the same respect. Thank you, Walter, for, com for, uh, for confirming that you got it. Let's see what else. Actually, uh, Marine, <laughs> not really. So locks only limit access to the code, not to the variables themselves. So if I if I do this right, if I if I simply comment these lines, this will stop being correct because the lock has no clue about x and y. The lock only can you know, controls access to a piece of code. So it's your job as a developer to choose what parts of code to protect to be correct. So the, the effect of the lock is limited to access to code. They are in no way connected to the resources. All right, any other questions, guys? Let me see if I've got oh, this is this is the last one for today. All right, so what's gonna happen after the the uh, Easter break? We will still have to do read write locks and barriers and semaphores. The read write locks are um, are a little complicated and it will take a little longer to explain. The others are not so complicated. And after this point, we're kind of done with the programming part. We'll only have the theoretical aspects to, to discuss. Uh, so let's talk about tests. So RD lock isn't really a lock asks headshot spy 
in a way you're right, in a way you're not. RD lock is not a lock as long as you only get RD lock calls. But RD lock is a lock for writers. It won't let writers go through. So RD lock doesn't exclude other RD locks, but it does exclude write locks. Yeah, well, yes, but actually, no, that's it, indeed. Write lock is a mutual exclusion thing, just like the mutex. It's only one writer that can take a lock. No reader can take the lock if the writer has it, and no other writer can take it if the writer has it. But if there is at least one reader with an RD lock, then no writers can get it. I've just realized that by the time you guys tell me that you got it, I've been probably over explaining it for a few good seconds. Sorry about that. <laughs> we'll live with it. So let's talk about exams. This is the least favorite piece of the whole thing, but we need to do it. So here we go. After the vacation, we'll have week 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. So this, is, this is the last week that we've got, six weeks. So my plan, and I will, I will post this on Piazza and on the class website, but this is the plan, and I'll consult with my colleagues, and only then I'll, I'll publish a, a final thing. <clears throat> Everybody passes by default. Well, you know what? If you check the statistics, it's not so bad. But if you check the, let's see, let me, let me check this now. How many people have we got online? Just out of curiosity. 37. You guys are 200. So I've got 37 people. Oh no, 98. That's not so bad. So you guys, so I've got 50% audience and a little less than that for the Romanian section. So yeah. That means uh, there will be some people failing because if they, it's it's unlikely that all the hundred people not here know this stuff, and if they don't hear it explained, it's gonna be tough for them to get it. But maybe they'll manage. So let's get back to exam scheduling. So the first week after vacation. It will be teaching, consulting hours, and so on. For second week, week 10, we should do the test for GrabSed Awk and the test for SH. Then we should have the exam for Shell, right? So GrabSed Doc and Shell in one shot. Then we'll have the exam for Shell. This will give you time to also practice for processes and threads. I have a market retention, <laughs> right? I, I got a market retention. I got to start making money, guys. Start cutting tickets to my show, huh? So after, okay, so then we'll have a, a, a week off and then we'll have the test for C, the test for processes and the test for threads. And then in the last week, we'll have the exam for processes and threads. So this is how I'm planning to, to do this, which will give you an ex, another five weeks to exercise processes and threads. Shell, two more weeks to exercise it. So you should have plenty of time. I will post this week exercise problems for processes and threads so that you can use them. And, uh, well... Tests will probably be challenging. We'll have issues with connections. Try to get your cameras working. Uh, I don't think I had 98 people uh, when the class started. So uh, for those of you who weren't here, here uh, is this beautiful piece of code that I wrote by myself. And I'm not exactly proud of it, but it's the best I could do. Uh, 
you click on exam and you make sure this this thing shows your camera my camera is covered so it works give permissions to the camera because this is the first step in actually getting uh, the exams going if your internet dies does your grade die well it really depends on the regime if we go totalitarian then yes make it easy for me and hard for you if if your if your network dies try to uh, try to announce this and we'll try to find the solution ideally because i get this also my network sometimes dies ideally you would have a uh, on your cell phone some way of communicating with the instructor we'll, we'll have to think of that and just let him or her know that your network is down and then we'll, we'll come up with a solution okay so uh, yeah copsy man please have a camera uh, you're at home you have everything there we need to make sure this exam actually means something so get a camera and you know comb your hair and look presentable and do the exam and then enjoy vacation well if the virus lets us do that uh, tests will be practical yeah so all this stuff is practical and then the written exam which i suspect will happen just in the same manner uh, but it will be about theory there will be some problems you need to answer uh, questions but you won't need to write code you'll just need to, to, to answer questions okay tests are the test will be taken during the lab hours absolutely unless you have another um, you know another uh understanding with your professor and choose another moment if i move my camera camera it does <laughs> scotch tape or maybe duct tape i don't know you've got a number of weeks to get this th th these things fixed get your camera working get your setup up and running and i, I think things will be all right okay any other questions have i missed anything three m military i don't think three m is making any more tape now they are only making masks because that's what's needed. All right, I, th I think I think we're done. It, it feels like we're done. There are no more questions about the material nor the exams. If there are, ask on Piazza. You guys have a great vacation, happy holidays, uh, and healthy holidays. We'll hear each other in two weeks then. That's about it for now. Bye to everybody. Oh wait, oh wait, Cl close here. I don't know, figure it out. Figure it out close here. Happy holidays to everybody. Bye bye.